you're only as good as knowing oh, your sexual you. resume yes. only qualifies you for the partners you've had in in the past so we um we tend to conflate skill and experience mm -hmm. um and just because you've done something a bunch does not mean that you kind of uh hone that craft and every time you, if you are with a new partner, if you're someone who has had prior partners and then you find yourself married, this is a new, this is a new landscape. This is a new, a new terrain, a new, a new tool, a new mechanism, new metrics. Um, and you don't want to come in pridefully to think that you already have it all figured out. Um, and again, that's part of that compatibility. There's a humility that comes with like sitting in a place of learner. Like, I want you to teach me what works. I want to listen. I want to pay, I'm going to study how, you know, your body responds when I touch you a certain way. And I'm also, I'm not going to just assume that I know once I get an idea of something, I'm going to ask you to get that confirmation that what I saw, I actually, you know, understood. Um, too often we approach that because we, again, sex is so transactional for the world we see that there is a right way to have sex. It's, you know, the right way to start, right way to, you know, foreplay, ends in, or have an orgasm, everybody rolls over to go to sleep. Today's guest is a believer, mom, Christian sexologist, intimacy expert, speaker, author. I remember seeing her on, uh, I believe, The Love Hour with Kev on stage and Melissa some, some years ago. And the first time I seen her, I was following her ever since. So to have her on today's recording uh, is a blessing. I've also seen her on Dear Future Wifey shared the stage with uh, Latarius Whitfield as well, as well. And so many other people, all you got to do is Google her name and, and she will pop up. Uh, she's also the founder of The Intimacy Firm, and she also has the podcast Daring Discussions, which I've been watching. I know she just dropped that lately, and we'll talk about that as well. Brave Hearts community, let's show some love to Brittany Broder-Smith. How are you doing, Brittany? Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me and you know all of those things that you laid out you know to god be the to god be the glory but thank you so much for having me amen amen well we are live if you have any questions for today's guest as you see we're going to talk about sexual compatibility uh this is going to be a great topic so if you have any questions make sure you drop them below and we will get those to Brittany and she can answer your question uh, as we jump into this, what is the biblical view of sexuality and, and how does it inform your approach? Yeah, um, I like to think early on in my career, um, God gave me three reasons that he created sex for um, uh, the three P's, as I would call them, procreation, partnership and pleasure. So when we think about sexuality, which is that umbrella term, sometimes we get caught up in just that those first three letters, just um, sex. But when we think about how the gift of sex and how God intended it, it really is all, all encompassing. We understand that he reserved sex for the covenant of marriage um, between husbands and wives and primarily to honor his commandment. The first commandment he gave Adam and Eve as husband and wife was be fruitful and multiply. And sex is the way by which we, um, we multiply. And then when he said, you know, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife and they become one flesh. That's that partnership um, experience. That spirit, there's a spiritual implication mm -hmm. to the becoming of one flesh and the joining together, but there's also a physical joining together and becoming one flesh and there's a sexual implication, but there's an intimacy that is reserved for the covenant of marriage that no matter how good your casual sex is, no matter how much you like your boyfriend, your man, your partner, your girl, whatever, how long y'all been together, it falls short. And, you know, as by testimony, I, I tried to hold on to God's unchanging hand before marriage, but you know, I've slipped a few times and <laughs> I had, I'm not going to pretend like I did not have good sex outside <laughs> of marriage. However, the experience and the bonding and the safety and the connection and the intimacy that was the sex within my marriage, I was married for 10 years, it failed in, it failed in um, comparison. 
Um, and then lastly, pleasure. Um, God in his infinite sovereignty and wisdom, when he intricately designed our bodies, he did so, created us as sexual beings again to continue on earth. But he didn't, he's omnipotent and sovereign. He did not have to give us erogenous zones. He did not have to give us the clitoris. He didn't have to give us the frenulum. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to, you know, create that nerve ending that, that drives from, that flows from your, you know, your nipples to your genitals. He didn't have to do that, nor was it some type of technological marvel or something that happened by evolution. When he saw all that he had made and said that it was very good, all of that was already, was already there. So, you know, I believe that he wants us to, I mean, he's obsessed with babies and I'm like, okay, guy, we get it. He wants us to continue having kids, but also he wants us to join together and connect together with our spouses and also feel good about it um, and feel good while, uh, while we are, while we are doing it. So, and that informs my work because everything that I do is to help people in come together or understand or grow in their knowledge of sexuality as it falls under those three umbrellas, whether it be procreation, partnership, or pleasure with the primary one being the partnership um, with the agency, the intimacy firm, was to really understand God's heart for sex intimacy and relationships and really get back to the communal experience, the relational experience, that human on human, life on life experience that I think God intended and as we get further, more steeped in this fallen world, life has become so transactional. So that's why um, the intimacy firm was created to kind of like bring the bring God's word back to the forefront and how He wanted His His creation to commune with uh, with one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. I love it because um, I, I would like to ask you in your own. In, in the book of Brittany, like how would you define sexual compa compatibility? And sexual compatibility for me is when you all have found that place um, in the culture of sex in your marriage where yes and no both have as safe a place to land, uh, where you have become students of each other's bodies, um, where you are experts of your own body and you are both a uh, student. You kind of do that dance between student and professor, student and teacher, if you will, depending on um, the situation. You are both invested in the health of the sexual culture um, and you invest in how you take care of your own body, the conversation that you have, the the do you invest in improving your relationship with sex because you believe that that will impact your sexual relationship and you also y'all you all are showing up as what i like to call wise lovers and that is as opposed to just a good lover a wise lover is someone who takes the information provided to them by their partner about what works what don't what doesn't work what they like what they're interested in what what is a hard pass and then they apply it we know that wisdom is knowledge applied and so sexual compatibility is when you found someone you can be wise with um and it's equitable and relational and we are we are thrilled by the sexual expression in our marriage and not one person feels like they're being consumed but they're also like they're being enjoyed and sex is an experience and not a chore so it's no i don't think that there's no there's uh one act like, oh, you make me climax or they make me climax or they do that move. I don't think that that's compatibility. Um, it, it's wonderful when it happens, um, but I do believe that sexual compatibility is created and not found. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. So it's so it's, it's really that intimacy piece where you really take the time to get to understand each other. Absolutely. Likes and dislikes, because a lot of times if people don't have that conversation. Yep, absolutely. And when like the definite colleague of mine, sexologist Shamira, she um had a definition of intimacy that I use all the time is being seen, heard, valued, and understood. So someone, if you're sexually compatible with someone, this is someone who sees you, hears you, values you, understands you, and then applies all of that in a way that you know, doing the things that make you go, mm, the, <laughs> that. <laughs> 
Yeah, for sure. I love it. Cause you said something, I was watching you last week. You said something about you, uh, in terms of sex, like you're only, I don't want to butcher it, but maybe you mm -hmm. can help me. you're only as good as knowing. Oh, your sexual resume yes. only qualifies you for the partners you've had in, in the past. So we, um, we tend to conflate skill and experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and just because you've done something a bunch does not mean that you kind of uh hone that craft and every time you if you are with a new part if you're someone who has had prior partners and then you find yourself married this is a new this is a new landscape this is a new a new terrain a new a new tool a new mechanism new metrics um and you don't want to come in pridefully to think that you already have it all figured out mm -hmm. um and again that's part of that compatibility there's a humility that comes with bit, like sitting in a place of learner like i want you to teach me what works i want to listen i want to pay i'm going to study how you know your body responds when i touch you a certain way and i'm also i'm not going to just assume that i know once i get an idea of something i'm going to ask you to get that confirmation that what i saw i actually you know mm -hmm. understood um too often we approach that because we, again, sex is so transactional for the world. We see that there is a right way to have sex. It's, you know, the right way to start, right way to, you know, for a play ends in or have an orgasm. Everybody rolls over to go to sleep. And it's like this kind of linear thing, which is not really true for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. What, what, what are your thoughts so far? I, I, I'm, this is, this is so good. It's so needed. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> often have conversations about sexual compatibility. So hearing the expert, uh, <laughs> <it> <laughs> which way it goes, is awesome to hear because it's like we, you know, have our opinions, of course. But hearing you actually like say what it is, it's like, oh, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's awesome. Aww, thank you. Love it. Love it. If you have any questions for today's guest, feel free to drop them below. We will get those to you. And uh, Brittany, we have a question to ask as well, but we'll kind of close the show with that. Okay. Uh, how do you address common issues like shame or guilt surrounding sex within the Christian faith? Um, Really starting like the conversation that we're having now, like really myth busting, um, really taking it back. Most times whenever I'm working with someone, especially in like my coaching program, we start with Genesis. We really go back to the foundations of the word, the word, because too many of us have lived compartmentalized life as it relates to sex and our faith. We can't like you'd be surprised how, you know, at these big old ages, people are still struggling to see God in sexual expression. And so when I'm just out here, you know, saying, you know, Jesus and deep throat in the same sentence, people are just like, whoa, hold on, hold on. Um, it, it's, it's rough for people. And they'll say, they'll come to me and say, Brittany, I know that I need this. I know. But when you say these things that kind of like, and these are people who are like, who really support me, who really love me, who share all my stuff, but they're like, you say things that I could never say. And so I, I don't, and honestly, well, one thing is I don't embarrass easily. So me and shame have a really unique relationship. So when people say like, I cannot believe you say, I'm like, Wow. Like, and I, and I'm not ignorant of the, the culture of church yeah. and purity culture, especially mm -hmm. like black church and all that. Like I get, it, I see where it comes from, but I believe that God probably, it's probably because what he called me to, he graced me not to have to carry, um, now carry that. Now I carry conviction about other things real bad. And he'd be like, girl, you still on it? I didn't let that go. That was 10 years ago. Why are you still there? So don't, I'm not acting like I don't know. So I truly get it. It's just this particular thing. Yeah. I don't, but I, because I don't, I am able to sit outside and have a more objective view as I'm walking people through discovering the source of the shame, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, we can't get over shame until we understand the source. It's just like, we can't just say, oh, I feel shame because I feel like sex is dirty. I was always taught that sex was dirty. That's that's too general. Like we got to pill. okay, you were taught sex was dirty. Who told you that? Mm -hmm. How did they, di how did they exhibit that? How did they display that? What were the consequences that you saw other people experience that you're trying to avoid? Who is this avatar of a person that you are running from 
when you decide, I don't want to do this in bed with my husband or my wife because X, Y, and Z, like you have this persona that you're trying to maintain and you feel like X, Y, and Z behavior is going to keep you from that, or you participated in X, Y, and Z behavior. And somebody told you that this behavior makes you this kind of person. And so shame conflates what we've done and, or what happened to us with who we are. So by going back to the beginning, we, again, establish sex as good and godly. But also as we're walking through, we look at Genesis 3 and we talk about the curse. So you all of the sexual implications in those in the curse, it makes sense that we struggle the way we struggle. It makes sense that sex is the sin that so easily besets so, you know, so many of us. Like God's greatest creation is coming here through the mechanism of sexuality. And so would not, wouldn't it make sense for the enemy to try us in that area? Of course he wants, he doesn't want more humans. He doesn't want more people that's here that's going to be at enmity with his offspring, right? You know what I'm saying? He he wants to, he wants, so I, I say all the time, like a sexually excellent marriage bed wages war against the enemy. Because when you are when when that when that's intact, it's a good uh, uh, almost a guaranteed sign that other everything else is intact. Maybe not perfect, but y'all if y'all can figure out how to to do it, and everybody is pleased, and it's not like that compliance. One person just showing up because this is my duty, but we really here because we want to be here. Then y'all can figure out what's going on with the dishes and who's going to take the kids over to Aunt Myrtle's. Like, okay, if we can figure out how to get naked together, we can figure out these bits. Yes, and you know what I'm saying? And so uh, the indication, the culture of sex in your in your relationship, in your marriage is an indication of the culture of your marriage. Mm -hmm. And so to overcome shame, I've really peeled, I am big on lowest common denominator, bring it down to uh, bite-sized bits, because when it's bite-sized and it's tangible, then it can be held accountable. I and mean, when we really be at one step at a time, people, when we talk, like we kind of generalize things, I was like, uh, 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 let's bring it back. Okay. You said this, who told you that? Where did they get that from? Show me this in scripture and not like word for word, because that's like, um, we don't want to look, skip over the principle or the spirit of the word, looking for the letter of the word. So first step, is there a thou shalt not X, Y, and Z in scripture? No. Okay. Is there a principle or some type of umbrella thing that leans towards it? And then we go, we go bit by bit. And then from there, give you the freedom to still choose. If you've worked through the shame of oral sex, because you feel like only certain type of women or certain type of men, you know, do that. And then you decide, like, I don't feel, I don't feel shame about it. I don't feel guilty about it. I just don't like it. That's okay too. Because sexual freedom is not, and freeing from shame is not, oh, now I'm into everything. It's okay, I've assessed it all. I, I've established what my values and beliefs and desires are around these areas. And now I'm freely moving in the freedoms and limitations of of my uh, my sexual identity. And that's what sexual being sexually free is. No matter how vanilla you can have missionary <laughs> once a month and be tickle pink and that'd be okay if that's your business. Or you could be live to that watch out now and that's your business, you know? As long as you ain't bringing nobody else in and ain't involve no kids or no type of, or and consent is there, have thine own way, okay? <laughs> and so that's how I work through your shame is really to just present God's gift from his word and help people walk through and parcel out this these sexual supposed to be. I think a lot of shame also comes because we feel like there is one way to be sexual and shame comes in where when we don't measure up or we exceed whatever we've been presented as the model sexual being. Mm. Mm. And that's kind of so it's kind of are you saying like that's kind of more like what we see in culture as far as like what we consider like the ultimate. Yeah, it's shame? yeah, it's a yes. And we see it in culture. Um, we see it in, and culture is a big word, right? We see it in culture as in we see it in society. We see it in the news. We see it on the media. We see it on social media, but we also see it in our families. We see it in those we look up to. We've seen it growing up. We model, we heard it or heard about it, um, or watched from afar with our parents or grandparents. All of the things like it's either like directly taught or caught 
and we have this this idea with all that comes together to make up an idea and what's called um it's a theory called the sexual script theory and these are the meanings and messages that we ascribe to sexual things and all of that comes together by what we've experienced and what we and what we've been directly taught and what we've observed and then how we see other people navigate it and then we on the other side we give meaning to these things and the script just like a script is to a movie our sexual scripts is to our sexual um decision making oh, never. that's good ah yeah so much stuff i want to ask that's, that's okay yeah um <laughs> i want to take a quick break for a second i want to talk about uh my wife and i created uh the love fearlessly intimacy questions. So mm -hmm. this is something that my wife and I put together, husband and wife, we had all these different discussions and conversations. So we want to ask you a question from the intimacy card deck. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so here, here's the question. Okay. How do you define infidelity or betrayal within the context of a relationship? Ooh, I think infidelity and betrayal are two different things, both problematic. I think infidelity involves betrayal, but you can have betrayal without infidelity. Mm. Um, so betrayal is a is not to use I hate to use the word in the def definition, but when there is a a area of trust an agreed upon um, relationship norm that you betrayed, meaning you did not show up in the way that you promised. You did not keep your word around this particular um, interaction or engagement. We've set this particular boundary for our relationship and you've betrayed my trust that you were going to comply or move in alignment with, or led me to believe that you are moving in alignment with this thing when you actually, when you actually were, um, were not. Um, that could be, you know, talking about your spouse behind your back. Like you could be dogging them, you know, dogging them out. That's betrayal, mm -hmm. right? You could, you know, spend all your money and now y'all destitute. That's a, a sort of, you know, betrayal. You could be, you know, at a strip club, you know, doing all the money. That's not infidelity per se, but still a betrayal. Nonetheless, if that type of entertainment is not anything that has ever been discussed, ever been agreed upon, or was discussed and you went ahead and it was clear that that was a problem and then you went ahead and did it anyway, mm -hmm. right? But as far as infidelity, for me, infidelity encompasses anything physically, verbally or emotionally that your part if your partner was in the room mm -hmm. they would have a problem not not that not they not that they not just that they would have a problem because there's things that people we're a little bit possessive as a people mm -hmm. and we think that people belong to us because mm -hmm. we're married to them and so it's tough to say that they would have a problem with it but it's like if it's almost a safe bet if you if you are doing something with another person verbally, emotionally, or physically that you would not do in front of your spouse, then you are either parked directly in or on your way to infidelity mm -hmm. lane. Yeah. Um, so that is obviously flat out adultery, flat out sex. That includes emotional um, affairs. There are, you know, y'all may have done everything, but all of that is anything, any type of sexual expression involving a, a person that is not your spouse mm -hmm. is infidelity. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. All right. Love it. Well, let's get back into these questions because I want to make sure that I value your time. Uh, can sexual compatibility be cultivated over time or is this something that's naturally present between partners? It's a both end. Um, and I'll say that if even if it's naturally present between partners, like y'all just out the gate, <laughs> kick it off mm -hmm. as life changes, 
and seasons change and you grow and ebb and flow, that compatibility may change, which is why when we originally talked about it, the definition of being a learner, being a student, being a professor, being equitable, being patient, being humble, all of those things are needed to make sure that that compatibility continues. Sure. Um, um, but I do think that it absolutely can grow over time, especially you know, for those of us who, you know, who are God's favorite and they did it the right way. Mm -hmm. You not you may, you don't know, you don't know what's going on. You don't know, you don't know your penis from your nipple right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, where it's supposed to go, what it's supposed to do. So it may not like the honeymoon, um, it's a lot of pressure placed on like honeymoons and wedding nights and stuff like that. So you first time out the gate, it may not be spectacular. And if it's not spectacular, again, more than likely, you feel like it's not spectacular because you're comparing it to something that you heard. We come in, no matter how virginal we are, mm -hmm. we come in with ideas of what sex is supposed to be. Um, but unfortunately, we, I mean, oh, that's unfortunately and unfortunately, mm -hmm. we live in a world where people are begin to have sex before they even really know what sex is. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about sex in some instances, we educate about sex, but we're not taught how to have sex. And it's that skill building that happens um, over time. And that adds to the compatibility. And I think that even the pleasure, like the availability of pleasure, the consistency and dependability of pleasure is a more, for me, crucial aspect than compatible, mm. right? Because like, you know, sexually compatible, like do y'all match? Like that could be, is like, you want it when I want it, but that still don't mean it's good. You're willing when I want it. That doesn't mean, you know, it's good. Like it, how dependable and available is pleasure in this connection? one way or another that's that's compatibility for me that's good mm. yeah i never looked at it like that <laughs> that is so good because we yeah because we, we we had these conversations <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> yeah it's so much so much for us to to, to discuss <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it off camera <laughs> we'll have everybody in our business <laughs> <laughs> for, for sure uh how can couples address differences in sexual desires and expectations within a christian framework um i i always recommend this is why it's important to have these type of conversations before the altar yeah right your certain sexual expect sexual expectations are more long-standing Whereas sexual interests and desires, those tend to ebb and um, ebb and flow, but the expectations they tend to be more long, long standing and sometimes non negotiable, um, which is why you need to have those conversations uh, ahead of time. Is when the moments where you see relationships or marriages argue and tussle the most around sex is because they're the difference in the non-negotiable. And now we're, you know, we're in a battle of wits or wills over, you know, what's going on. And then we run the risk of beginning to weaponize scripture mm -hmm. so that we can get our way yeah. um, when yeah. it's never intended. Yeah. Right. And it's never intended to be like that. So I think it's important to just don't use no euphemisms. Don't try to be cute. Don't try to be coy or clever. Like just as readily as you would talk about like y'all map out your budget. Talk about your you your your sexual expectations. And if it's particularly when you feel like they aren't being met. Like if there's a difference or a discrepancy or a mismatch in libido or a readiness for sex, we have we talk about it. And if it's if five days a week one partner wants it in three days a week, the only three days a week, the other partner want, doesn't, then what's happening on those two days that makes sex not a, a um, interesting for the other partner? It could just be, I'm, I'm tired. It could be, you know, it hurts. It could be, it ain't that, or it could be, it ain't that good, right? A lot of times we talk about why a person isn't having sex or we talk about the fact that the person isn't having sex, but we don't talk about why. And the question is, do you not like sex or do you not like the sex that you're having? Mm. 
And so once we, if we peel back those layers, right? Cause it could be so, it could be so simple as because you want to always do it at nighttime and I got to get up early. So if you get up early in the morning, we can do it every day. <laughs> and so then people, and then what happens? Like, but you know, sex supposed to happen at night, or I got, I don't want to get up early, or I don't want to break my sleep. And there we go. Now we got those non negotiables or those, you know, important details we're bumping heads. And so if one person were to humble themselves and shift, a lot of times it's small things. A lot of times it's a matter of scheduling sex. Like you can get sex more consistent when you put it on, when you put it on the calendar. If you have to schedule a babysitter and you know grandma comes over and takes the kids for five hours every single Thursday, then every single Thursday is our sex day. So why are we fighting about not having sex on Tuesday when the kids are running amok when we know Thursday she won't be here. So we can sit and text and send, you know, describe in great detail all the things I'm going to do to you Thursday at 502. So don't even, as a matter of fact, at 458, go and get in the shower. So when soon as they walk out the door and pull out the driveway, I'm 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 on you. I'm right there. Hey. You know what I'm saying? We fight, like we fight things that we don't necessarily need to fight. And I see that mm -hmm. a lot of times as like a primary reason for that mismatch. Uh desire but then sometimes there's a, a more you know serious things like um the sex is not good or it's you know pe the husband isn't delaying penetration enough meaning there's not enough foreplay so their sex is painful so i'm avoiding it because it's not good i have never met a woman run from who will run from an orgasm <laughs> unless unless you know she's single and don't want to make god mad <laughs> but you know i've never met a wife who is going to run from a freely available orgasm mm -hmm. where she feels centered and she feels important and she feels cared for as opposed to just consumed. Mm -hmm. And husbands, while they may take or participate in the compliant sex, they don't want that. Nobody wants compliant sex. When you be like, all right, here, all right, sure, here I come. They may go along with it, mm -hmm. They'll take but it. they want, but it. men want to be wanted too. Men want to look as much as they walk around scratching and clawing that light, begging like you gonna give me something later. Men want to hear, want to be asked, are you gonna give me something later? They may not say it. They may not. They may be too cool for school. They may be a little more, you know, laid back. But they want to hear that. They want to feel that. And I think that you know, pride and silence plays wreaks havoc on those type of things. So to have to answer your question, we need to lay all of that down and just lay our cards up on the table about what's going on, what the what your desires are, what's missing, how you're feeling, and also what the, uh, what the issue is and allow each partner to feel how they feel. So if you have someone who is higher desire, more um, spontaneous desire, they are going to have sex on their mind more often. It doesn't have to be anything particular special going on. It's Tuesday and you blinked too long. Now I want some. It does, and there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with that. But we tend it, it's easier for us to tell the other person they're doing too much or not enough than it is for us to look at maybe we need to pick it up or slow it down. So yeah, ah, love it, love it. This is so. So, how do you tell someone like the sex? You know, especially if you're married, how do you tell mm -hmm. someone like the sex isn't good? Like, how do you, how do, how do you break the ice on that? Well, there is a a good way, and then there's my way. See, I don't have time for all the the him and the horn. Hey. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> what we what can we do about it? That that's me. I am a straightforward cut to the chase type with tact, right? With respect. But you know, there is this presumption, and it's not necessarily an untrue one, that for example, that men e men's egos are so fragile that if you you don't want to tell them that it's not good. You don't want to tell your husband that you don't like it because you don't want him to you know, feel away. That doesn't make sense. There's a maturity. If that is the case, if I can't tell you to stop putting your tongue in my ear, we have bigger issues. <laughs> and I'm and so I'm supposed to sit here soggy eared because I don't want to hurt your feelings. 
Meanwhile, you humping and pumping away, and then you climaxing in La La Land, and now I got to get up and get a towel, and you know, you feel like I just went came from the water park, and like it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't serve individuals. It doesn't serve the the union. So I would, I definitely recommend you having a conversation when nothing else is going on, um, and have it in a way where in that same environment where you would have any other tough, seemingly tough conversation, right? Like, you know, some people, when we're in the middle of it, if your partner is not like a think on the fly, move with their feet type of person, then when they go to do that move that they always do after the fifth pump, maybe it's not the right time then to say, I hate that pump. Like, you know, you should have probably told them that beforehand to give them time to wrap their heads around it but or if you feel like they're good in the moment because they need visual aids then don't tell them over dinner and then expect them to remember because when you told them about the flowers that you needed them to get for your grandma they got to home depot and did what bought something else because they just didn't pay attention your partner everywhere you go there you are so i think we overcomplicated talk to your partner because it's about sex because it's about a disappointment in this particular area talk to them about what you don't like what you what's what you desire what you want more of just like you would any other thing when you ask them what for din what's for dinner when you go in the in your in the kitchen and ask for a a, another a second helping or another plate or more less sugar can i get some salt these are all things like hey we're all making changes and if we i think we just make sex so so tense that it makes it difficult but i would sit down have a conversation not during a moment where you all are already fussing do not tack it on to some other argument you're arguing about the bills and it's like and another thing <laughs> you haven't spent 75 dollars in lube because for whatever reason you can't seem to come to bed wet like that's not we're not that's not helpful it's not productive well it um, makes me wonder like if you all are already having like communication issues mm -hmm. like can you really have that if you all are already have it, you can't like because it but but my thing is, and this I'm this is an unpopular opinion, but if you all are having communication issues, sex might need to be off the table for a while. Mm -hmm. Y'all need to address them communication issues because the thing is that sex is vulnerable. I need to be able to feel safe. And if I cannot communicate with you, if everything I say to you gets misunderstood or misconstrued or thrown back in my face, that's not a safe place to have sex. That's not a healthy culture of of sex in in marriage and then and then conversely if the only time y'all can see eye to eye is mm -hmm. when y'all naked again we have another problem that we need to work on and sex need to be off the table for a while so that we can say what's happening while we're having sex that we seem to always figure it out and how can we apply that to the bills and our five-year plan and you know submission and all the other things that all the other ways that we have to show because sex is just it's an important blip but it is just a blip in the overall you know culture of of a marriage but yeah like number like like i said um try not to do it when there's all when it's already heated it's helpful if you sit down and just have the conversation when nothing else is going on. When your part, when you have your partner's undivided attention, don't try to bring it up during the football game or Real Housewives just came on. She's sitting down watching Love Is Blind reunion. She does not care that you. She's not worried of hearing you say, "Oh, you keep using your teeth." And last couple of times, you you scratch me. She's not listening, so don't do it then. And I also like to. As much as you say, I don't like this, also share what you do like. Yeah. Like, I really enjoyed when you did X, Y, and Z. Well, you know, next time we get, we in, you know, we in the bed and we doing a thing. Can we have more? Can I have more of that? Can we do that a little bit longer instead of, you know, this? Like, I know, like, I don't say nothing when you put your tongue in my ear, but I don't really like it. I would prefer... You know, the, so we're you, you're offering crit critique, but also giving an avenue for a solution. Sometimes we will complain, but do not, but we don't really even know what we want. We know what we don't want, but we don't know what we do want. So we'll complain and tell our partners to stop doing X, Y, and Z, but are not able to offer any other solution. So now you just strip them away, stripped away from them everything that they knew to be accurate or true about their sexual yeah. prowess and you and then you left them to figure it out 
on, you know, on their own, which also causes that kind of, you know, ego or aggression or sadness or like, and then, you know, some people are like, well, you know, I guess I just don't do nothing right. You said that one, not nothing. Now, now you want to catastrophize, please get about out my face. And now we're arguing about other things because like you said, could we not communicating well? Well, it, this made me think of something else. Like mm -hmm. I think a lot of time, especially in the Christian community, women <laughs> are made to feel that they have to have sex with their husbands. Otherwise their husband's going to leave and like mm -hmm. our literal existence is here to satisfy our husbands sexually. Like, cause you yep. know, we're the only ones who can please them. And we're only, so taking sex off of a table, for instance, if we're having communication issues, like, yeah. I think a lot of women don't feel like they can do that because, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, well, he's going to go cheat or this is my duty. Like as a wife, I have to yeah. give my husband sex. So if you yeah. want to speak to that. Yeah. So there's a difference. That's, you know, Corinthians do not withhold, but for a time, unless you agree for fasting, you know, cause you'll be tempted and all those things. So, um, Again, that's where I get my premise of a sexually ex excellent marriage being wages war against the enemy. But sexually excellent doesn't mean every single day, all day you are having sex. And if we have se if we stop having sex, then our, our marriage is in danger because your marriage, the health of your marriage should be able to sustain a break. Yeah. Right. And there's a difference between withholding. The scripture says do not withhold and denying no tonight or no right now and even in scripture there's a allowance for but for a time mm -hmm. right and it says for fasting but for in that moment we're we're trying to figure something out and if it can if it includes fasting then hallelujah because you know these things come by fasting and praying and so we have we fast but also we're spending some time just seeing each other like i don't like we need to take a step back we need to increase our intimacy we need to increase our sensuality all of those things to establish let that be you know the the um pilot if you will the pilot like for this this you know ecstasy and you know this flame that when people talk about all the time like how to keep you know how to keep it spicy how to you know bring it lit light it back up or whatever all of the euphemism that we use about like bringing that spark back mm -hmm. taking it back take it because we can get lost in sex sometimes when it's transactional we just kind of wham bam thank you ma'am we're going on going about our business but it's the intimacy that happens on the day-to-day -day surrounding your relationship that makes that sexual experience that much more i like to say empathy which is on honoring your partner as a human leads to empathy intimacy which is that being seen her valued and understood which then leads to ecstasy mm -hmm. right we put mm -hmm. arrows we try to put arrows before agape you got the like the, you can't even hold the door for me and you want me to <laughs> drop it low like yeah yeah That's right. every time you go to the store you bring me a cheesesteak like i i've been vegan for 10 years you you don't you don't want to be no time yeah but you want to see how long can I go? Like mm -hmm. what? Yeah, you want to be known. That makes you feel loved. Exactly. And it, it, that's it, why it, God, that's why we love God so much. And exactly, exactly. Good scripture says his thoughts for us outnumber the grains of sand. He is all he is mindful. And if we are, if we again at all points take a description, we even look at the fruit of the spirit, like a good, a good sexual love partner, a good sexual lover exhibits the fruit of the spirit inside and outside of of the bedroom mm -hmm. and that just work like and the sex then is just a physical expression of the things that are already there and already bu bubbling over but to your question about not feeling like you have to because what's the alternative right if you feel like it's your duty and you say not tonight or no or you feel like you can't if he takes it or makes you do it anyway now we're talking about something else mm -hmm. Right. Because consent, first Corinthians, what is it, six or seven, whichever that scripture is, does not circumvent consent. Mm -hmm. You yeah. still got to be on board. You still got to you know, want this and that coercion and that convincing and kind of like wearing somebody down. Section is the last is you should never convince somebody to have sex with you. And then if you are the partner who are consistently saying no or not tonight, you should not have to be convinced to have sex, like if you got to be talked into it, then there's another conversation that is not being had. Either it, I don't care if it's pain, 
you may need to address that. If you're if it's too late or too early, you need to address that. If you don't like if they if they humping uh too much or too hard, you need to address that. If they a pillow princess and you bored, you need to address, you know, you need to address that. There is a if you are actively avoiding sex, there is something, either a discussion or a, a, either a need or a humility or um a need for humility that is is somewhere you know somewhere in there mm -hmm. um and i think that that's i think we focus too much on the duty part of it yes it's in scripture yes we're supposed to do it but also in that passage when paul was talking to that um the church of Corinth, they were they were running amok and they were sex was being used as like a uh, uh, over you holding over people's heads it's like a you a carrot dangling like a manipulative way to get what you want. So I ain't gonna give you nothing until you do X, Y, and Z. And so, and God is like, I gave this this you don't own this. You ain't in charge of this. I gifted this to this union to this covenant for both of us for both of you all to be able to enjoy freely. It is a gift. You cannot take charge over a gift that I gave you. Again, that doesn't mean you don't have consent. But what it means is you can't use it to manipulate to get what you want. And when we do things like withhold sex in order to get our honey-do list done, or we, or we only comply with certain requests with the promise of sexual activity, and that's all manipul All of that is manipulation. All of that is manipulation. If you're not going to help fold them clothes unless you're going to get a... Uh, a good tongue in later, that's manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. That is so, oh my God, there are so many questions I want to ask you. Oh my God. Yeah, because I, I wanted to say too, like, I think a lot of Christian couples struggle, and, and, and you can let me know because I obviously I'm not <laughs> the expert. Do you think a lot of Christians like take God out of the bedroom? Like, God has nothing to do with sex. This is something totally different. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that I think most Christians live at either end of those of that spectrum. They either take him completely out and cannot and compartmentalize their identity or his identity as our as our God, as our Lord and Savior from sex. As it's just like this thing that he God turned when it comes to sex, God turns his back on that. Like he don't, he'll come back to being God when I'm done. Once I go to the bathroom and put my clothes back on, then he come back to being God. They're either over there or over here. And they're weirdly, you know, respectful. Uh shout out, no disrespect to to the bishop. But you know, you remember he came out with that that sex C D. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah, that was that was yeah. Shout out to yeah, that was that I'm was. not there. I don't want TD Jakes nowhere near when I'm taking my clothes off. Like yeah. okay. And yeah. so and they see, you know, sex is a form of worship and you know <laughs> we honor God's creation. We honor his, we see his hand in the gift we are respectful that we are engaging with um a, a child of god and in, in the way we care for them and concern for them and all that and we and we thank him for it afterwards but i'm not i oh my when i say oh my god at the moment it's not i don't want him i'm not calling him down for that that's for something else <laughs> <laughs> so that's why i think i think they're on unfortunately we're on we're we're on either either way and i think the ones that are on the other end um unfortunately fear plays a big factor i think it's from a good place like we want to honor him we want to even like the extremes of anything is motivated by fear it, it's, it's motivated by we either fear being controlled or we fear you know stepping out of line but that's not freedom that's not that's not the freedom uh, and this is when the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if the spirit of the Lord is resting on your home and resting on your Mary's bed, you are free. Mm -hmm. And you ain't got to bring them with you. You know what what you want them what what do you want them to give you a score at the end of it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Oh my God. Uh <laughs> what advice would you give to couples dealing with past trauma impacting their intimate life? 
Wow, that's that's another one of those things that I, we kind of missed the missed the mark with not addressing prior to the altar. Sexual trauma, unfortunately, uh, especially for like black and brown women with black women. Um, one in four Black women will experience some sort of sexual coercion before their 18th birthday. So it is, that's 25% of, that's even if we take it to the church and women in the church. And I, it may even be more for the Christian experience that that's so much, 25% have had this experience, which means as a kingdom, we need a mechanism for, and a society, we need a mechanism for making trauma support and mental health you know needs a uh, like making it okay to do making it a priority to yeah. do let it not people shouldn't be getting cookies for going to therapy you need to go to everybody needs to be you know in in therapy so i think that if there's someone who is on their way to being coupled or married, if you had that in your past, even if you feel like you're all good, it does not hurt to talk with someone. I also think that it is important. I know we don't like to kind of dig up old stuff or open those wounds, but you have to expose the wound to treat it. Yeah. Right. If you keep it covered, but for so long, that's how infection without treating it, that's how infection gets to set. And if it doesn't get, they tell you all the time after a certain while, you got to take that bandage off and let it get some air for it to for it to heal. Mm -hmm. And if there are aspects of your relationship or things that your partner are is doing knowingly or unknowingly that is triggering those traumatic experiences, we need to have a conversation about it. But a lot of times we want to be so strong. We want to be over it. We want it to be out of our mind that we just grin and bear and don't say, when you snatch me like that, I go right back. You know, I go right back there. So it's a twofold responsibility to go talk to the lady about whatever you got going on, but also talking to your partner so that they are aware what's happening. Because it's also traumatic to feel like you're triggering your partner mm. who has been through a traumatic experience. Like if you go to reach out for your partner and they're like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? That now it's like, now you feel like a perpetrator mm -hmm. and you, you know, and then the other person begins to feel bad. And now you're like, Oh, I just want, now you're placating the, the, the emotions of your partner, even though you're hurting on the inside. It's just like a vicious it's a vicious cycle. So first and primarily, absolutely therapy. But, it, and again, the continual, continual conversation. Like, I think that most of what we struggle with is the things that we refuse to talk about. True. Sure. Love it. Love it. This is uh, the last, there's a question that was asked. I'm going to keep them anonymous. So we're going to end the show with this. Uh, the question is, I'm dating a guy. He's perfect for me, but he doesn't seem to value sex the same way I do. When I talk when I talk with him about it, he made me feel like I was acting like a hornball in my twenties. Mm. I shared my thoughts honestly about intimacy or what I wanted out of intimacy. All I can hope and pray is that he's thinking about the things we talked about. What are your thoughts on that? I'm gonna hold your hand when I say this. <laughs> he's not perfect for you. Mm. If you say he's perfect for me, but then he's not perfect for mm -hmm. you. He may be a good guy. Y'all may get along well. Y'all may have a lot in common, but y'all do not have this in common. So he's not perfect for you. There's a, So the statement is, this is a guy that I really like. We get along well. However, we differ on the importance of sexuality. We do not prioritize sex or whole sex as the priority, you know, the same. I feel, but then that piece about he made you feel like a hornball, that is a don't know the man, yeah. probably a good person. But I, my, my heart wants to say that's a character thing, but not in a negative way, meaning that sounds judgmental. And so he's not likely just judgmental about this particular thing. You may find you do something else that falls short of what he think is important, what he think is good. He may say or act or, or make you feel in a particular way. Now, the other piece to that, though, is I don't believe that anybody can make you feel anything that you don't even remotely already feel yourself. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. right so this idea of you being a hornball at your 20 you may him saying something in that negative way may have touched the spot of something either somebody else has said or you might have tried to believe kind of believed yourself or trying to kind of get out of you know your yourself a lot of times insecurities we feel that way because we assume that other people have the thoughts that we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so he may have very much, and you know, I'm a girl's girl, so it's his fault. It's like, I'm just playing, <laughs> but um, I'm just joking. But I would, I would, it, I would encourage you to examine that piece of it, like how he reacted to how, what, how much you prioritize sex and what, what is likely to change about that. Right. Because you said, I hope that he's thinking about this and he may need to think about it. He especially if y'all are believers and he may have compartmentalized like I'm not thinking about sex. I don't want to hear about it. I need to be in with my blinders on in my zone so that I can get on to the other side. And so thinking about that in a moment may be, you know, too much. But if it gets it's not if this is just who he is, mm -hmm. then you have to ask yourself five, ten you know, 20 years from now, it's easy when y'all are just dating and be like, oh, we'll get to that. But when you get your license and you're ready to go for a drive and he's like, then what, where we going to, what are we going to, what are we going to do this? We're not talking about uh, him, whether he prioritized travel or not. He don't like to travel. I catch you. Watch my dust. I'm going to go. I see you when I get home. Like you ain't got to be, you know, we, you ain't got to be with me. He, you know, you like, uh, gospel, like Shirley Caesar, holler screaming gospel. And he's CCM. Go on. Huh. You take that guitar music and you, that and you'll go in the basement with that. And we for us for me and my house, we finna be speaking, speak, uh, speaking in tongues and throwing oil around up here. Y'all can, y'all can, y'all can figure that out. But this of how we prioritize sex and how you are made to feel about how important sex is in, in your life, that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. That's I'm not I'm not I'm never gonna tell nobody to leave their man yeah. unless he putting his hands on them. Mm -hmm. But something to consider. A conversation, a further conversation to be had. This is not something that you can hope or assume. You ain't got to beat him over the head with it, but we definitely need to revisit this conversation before we take this any before we take this any further. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Wow. This, <laughs> Brittany, this has been a phenomenal episode. Thank you so much um, for taking oh, some time you. out of your day to be a guest. Like, absolutely. I greatly appreciate this. Uh, I told my wife, I was like, you got to be on with me. Like, <laughs> I get to interview Brittany. You got to come on with me. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate uh, you all's support. Um, I can always count on you to comment and share. And I just appreciate like, cause I see, you know, also that the work that you all are doing and, you know, just it's an honor not to, and I consider you a co-laborer in, you know, in this, um, in this field of someone who was married for 10 years and thinking of, you know, trusting the Lord for a next go around. It is indeed scary to remarry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, it, this was, this was a pleasure. This was, and it was, it was absolutely an honor. So I really appreciate you for allowing me to share this year platform. Wow. Thank you so much. Well, can you let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, what you got going on, all that good stuff? Absolutely. So I am at the Intimacy Firm on everything. Uh, my primary platform is Instagram. You know, I play around on TikTok sometimes, but that's in the close in January. So <laughs> we'll know what's up. We'll know what's up with that. But yeah. um, and then my website, if you want to get in touch with me directly, my website is um the intimacy firm, www.theintimacyfirm.com. If you want to consider, you know, intimacy coaching, I have a um program called Naked and Unashamed, Building Sexual Confidence as a Christian Woman. Um, that's for single or married women. And I also have a intensive intimacy program for couples who are trying to, you know, get back on, get back on track. Um, and as shared earlier, my podcast Daring Discussions is out now. Episode five just dropped today. Um it comes every Tuesday at um, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube and at midnight on all of your um, audio 
platforms. I'm trying to get my watch hours up. So that would be a wonderful blessing if y'all can go on over there. I don't care if y'all just play the playlist and just let it play in your background while you go wash the dishes. That's your business. Or put it on your TV and then go to work. I don't care. We just need to get to the fourth act. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please and thank you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, y'all heard Brittany. Make sure y'all get those watch hours up. Yes. Uh, I, was, I was watching you at work today and you talked about you uh, talked about with the masturbation and 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 how God wasn't a priority because that became first and 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 then the food and child tell her all my business. I went up there, got in front of that camera, and told all my business. I said, my God, I said, I said, Lord, you but I mean you better save ten thousand with this. And uh, will <laughs> I need ten thousand to come to Christ behind this Amen. because I just laid all Ooh. my business on front street, but it. It was, it was one of those things where I was like, the question of is masturbation a sin, questions about pornography, questions about um, fornication. I get those questions all the time. And I'm like, we're going to talk about masturbation. I can't do it in good conscience and do it justice without my, without my, testimony. my testimony. Yeah. Um, and it was like a, like a balance. Like I, you know, I know that people look up to me. I know that people, you know, see me as a, a guide and a source of, you know, whatever. And so sometimes the frailties of the people that you look up to can kind of lead, you know, could lead you astray. And that was my hope. Like, God, I don't want to me to share this. And then people feel like, oh, well, if she messed up, I might as well go. I don't, I didn't want that. But he also he kindly reminded me, Girl, you you're not that powerful. Go go say what I told you to say, and I take care of the rest. The outcome is 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 my responsibility. You go do what I said. Mm -hmm. I said I said okay. We thank you for your obedience. I hang up on you, not the mood is what I said. <laughs> no, that was but good. Yeah. It, it helped you. me. It helped me. Prior, I'm like, oh God, oh so I'm not prioritizing you. Mm. So that helped me out to yeah praise god yeah. praise god yeah so amen. it was so we we hope that you know that it could say it's been received really well we'll say that there have been you know no no negative comments nobody said anything anything crazy um but so we'll see i just pray i honestly just pray regardless of who it reaches how many numbers it it does as long as it reaches somebody who is ready to re is able or strengthened to recommit Amen. To God. Yeah. No problem. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your time, Brittany. Definitely Absolutely. appreciate the work that you are doing. Continue to touch the people because Lord, we need you. <laughs> thank you. Praise God. Praise yeah. God. Thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity. No problem. And uh, I'll get this up uh, as soon as possible. I'll tag you on social media and all the other good stuff. And uh, okay. yeah, we'll make it work. Awesome. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All mm -hmm. right. Take care. Bye. Bye.